Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it, Midweek Editions here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. Hope you're doing all right. A little dose of football before uh, we send you on to Husker Volleyball up in Omaha. And a full show for you, wherever you can hear us, along the Hale Varsity Radio Network. Numbers to get in, 466-3776, 466 76 800 825 5865. Can email the show Chris at HaleVarsity.com. And plenty of follows. You need to make a part of your Twitter habit uh, at Schmidt underscore radio. Chris Schmidt, that's me at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. And as always, follow at Hale Varsity and follow radio at H Varsity Radio. Loaded up here in about 20 minutes. Mike Babcock will join us. Mr. Husker Football. Get Babber's take on the first two games. I haven't talked to Mike in 40 years, man. It's been way too long. I uh, love talking football on Wednesdays with Mike Babcock. We'll get his take on the event at CHI as well. Historic, all-time record-breaking, the red versus the blue. And uh, plenty of hail varsity on staff. Aaron Sorensen, Jacob Badilla on site there for all your coverage needs. Uh, Mike Shuhart going to join us from Wilderness Ridge Golf. Shuey's a huge football fan. Shuey, uh, I think, wants to get out there and make a tackle. We'll also uh, get his take and opinion on the Tiger Woods putter that was uh, just auctioned off. And in hour two, Evan Bland of the Omaha World Herald going to be with us. And Husker Hall of Famer, College Football Hall of Famer, Zach Wiegert. You've got some inductees to the College Football and the Nebraska Football Hall of Fame. Going to be honored. Of course, you're doing the throwback tribute to the scoring explosion this weekend, uniform-wise. We're going to be in town for Oklahoma, but we caught up with, uh, well, Mr. Outland winner and a part of that pipeline. So Wiegert in about an hour 20. You can email Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Elijah, how you feeling, man? We're 24 hours away from the NFL, and we're about three days away from uh, a, a little bit of truth serum with Nebraska football defensively. Well, really looking forward to, uh, to the Thursday night football game where we'll start off there. Uh, I uh, lucked into Josh Allen in the fourth round in my fantasy football league, so uh, I'll be watching that uh, with uh, Ernest as uh, fantasy football really consumes my life uh, around this time of year. I'd really uh, like to avoid getting L tattooed somewhere on me, which is our, our punishment. So you guys, you're part of the tattoo league. There's, well, we, we got, it. We got your, your choice. If you don't want to get the tattoo, which is lame, you can buy everything necessary for the draft in next season. That's not, so you have to fund next year's draft. That's all the food. That's all the beer. That's anything that, that is, is needed for the draft. So how many guys? Two guys per team, 10 teams? Uh, we are 12 guys, 12 teams. Ooh. So it ends up being a lot of people, especially uh, once you, you factor in someone's going to bring along their girlfriend or whatnot. Or, They're just going to hammer you. So it, yeah, and it, and it ends up like once you take a trip to sports casters afterwards, you know it ends up being a couple hundred dollars. So <sighs> I'll take the loss on that, and or not the loss. I'll let everyone else pay for their own stuff, and I'll get a ta- an L tattooed on me. Okay. And uh, if I lose, but I'd rather not. And I really like how my team is looking this season. So you're, you're ink free, correct? For now. Okay. For okay. now, well, get back to me in January. <laughs> 30, 30 years and counting the Jeff Bargain Memorial Fantasy League. Uh, so I've been in that since I was in junior high. Tom Rathman, yes, is my first draft pick. I let Rathman know about it last time we talked to him. Uh, so we had our draft, but we won't bore you with our drafts. But I do love the skin in the game, literally, for you with the Tattoo League. That's pretty awesome. Defense will win championships. Defense will make November bearable. Defense will make you rip your hair out. All of the above, very true. So, Elijah, let's dive in with some Nebraska football thoughts. And Coach Frost will be with the media tomorrow. But the attention isn't void on offense, but it's been more positive this week. It's been more positive 
with uh, what you did running the football. It's been more positive because of Anthony Grant. It's been more positive with Trey Palmer going up and making a play on third and, I don't know, 72nd Street, Hmm. third and no street. Long ways to go deep into your own territory. So you saw some progress from the offense last week, albeit against all these qualifiers, albeit against North Dakota. You got to see some progress defensively. If I'm a if I'm a black shirt, if I'm a guy that's been here on campus, I'm sick of hearing about how bad the defense has played. That that would just be me personally, and I want to go out and do something about it. But there's ways to do it, and from a trust standpoint, it seems like that's been an issue. Makes sense, absolutely makes sense because you've not played together with this group very often. Uh, Caleb Tanner and Garrett Nelson have played together. Luke Reimer's played a lot of football. E hasn't. He just played high school football last year for Columbus, crushing people on the interior. If you're Ty Robinson, you've lined up a handful of times next to the polar bear that you've not lined up that often with Wynn or or Drew, right? And, and Feast is seeing some big-time reps for the first time in his career, because he's a he's a great story, and he's a guy that's going to give you some nice effort. Had a good first half against Northwestern, but Ty Robinson is your anchor. Ty Robinson's your big time recruit, and Ty Robinson's a guy that that was in front of the media earlier this week and was answering questions. And he believes it's his job to get this defense fixed uh, a little bit from Ty earlier on, and and this is what I think bothers Nebraska fans. Yes, they you don't like missed tackles. Totally get that. But if you get bullied in the phone booth, you just have a hard ta- time taking that if you're a Nebraska fan and you have a harder time imagining it'll get fixed, right? Context is, this was North Dakota. The worry is, what's Wisconsin going to do? What's Minnesota going to do? What's Oklahoma going to do? And while I, mean, I, I like that you have, you left Iowa completely out of it there. Well, by the by, <laughs> we season, all saw their offense by, by <laughs> season's end, you know what? Your your D line, your front seven, your interior don't get any better. Hell, Iowa's going to run for two bills on you again. I agree with that. Okay, Iowa can come in with, and, and Kaz laid it out yesterday where their offense is ranked between like eighty fifth and a hundred and fifth. They are what they are, but. They do put up good linemen. And whatever happens against Iowa State, Iowa will be ready for Nebraska. And they've been very physical. But physicality is the name of the game. And Ty Robinson touched on that uh, uh, on, on Monday's press conference. I think uh, it all starts with a defensive line. I, I can know I, say, I can say personally I haven't been as physical as I, I know I can be. Um, I think it starts there. Physicality, uh, knock back on the defense or on the offensive line. Um, that's all I really can say from a defensive line standpoint. Is it starts with us. It does, and, and he's accepting that challenge. It's it's imperative that they get to a higher level. And doing your job, Elijah, is is so key. And it gets back to that newness, that unfamiliarity, more from from Big Old Ninety Nine. Yeah, we really uh, slowed down. I think there was a bunch of us that were trying to make uh, game-changing plays against Northwestern and really just being over-aggressive. And so uh, throughout last week, we really just focused on doing our job, uh, making the knowing that the guy next to me is going to do his job as well and the plays will, the, the tackles will come to us. So guys got to do their job. They got to have trust. And, and part of that doing your job and having trust is like defensive line is a little bit unique on the defense in that you can have a, a good game, an eight out of ten game, without making a single tackle. No, like, you like, do like, your job, you plug the hole, or you, you keep guys off of your line. Exactly. It comes back to what he said starting off here, which with the physicality. If you can be a physical defensive lineman that stands up the guy in front of you, doesn't get moved on a double team, keeps those offensive line off the linebackers, you can be the person that makes the tackle even though you're, you're nowhere close to actually making the tackle. If you follow what I'm saying, if you free up a linebacker because you've eaten up a double team, they can't get to second level, and the linebacker's able to shoot through the line of scrimmage and make a play, the defensive lineman's made that tackle technically because they're the ones that freed up the linebacker to go make the play. And you can have a good game by doing your job, being physical, while still not making any plays. And I think that's what he's alluding at 
to here with the, the defensive line needing to be more physical and do their job. And it, it starts with the fundamentals of eating up the offensive line first before you focus on doing anything else. Here's questions I have out loud. All right. And this isn't throwing anyone under the bus. It's a it's a legit question through through two games. From a conditioning standpoint, I have zero doubt with Zach Duvall. He has got dudes big, strong, fast, and physical. But there is some internal motivation that needs to happen if you're a big dude on the line of scrimmage to be able to, to, to outlast your opponent. Or from a rep and a rotation standpoint, don't get worn on with 4,000 reps during one game. I mean... So what is what's practice been like? What's the rotation in practice been like? And what's what's the preparation and simulation been like? Okay? And this is Ty Robinson about seeing more ones in practice. Good. You see the, the number one offense, fantastic. That presumably will get you ready for some of the, the, the twitch athletes you'll see in Georgia or from Georgia and also Oklahoma and on down the road. But that's an adjustment that's got to be happening or has happened is supposed to happen this week we always welcome that um i think iron sharpens iron so it's really great uh for our ones to go against the offensive ones just so we can keep getting better and better and better um and we don't really have any like uh, delay or kind of plateau we just like i said we're going to keep going up Dawson was brought up again by Robinson here when it comes to making some of those improvements. Coach Dawson knows what he's doing, so uh, I trust what he wants to do. Uh, I think with Northwestern, I think with it being the first game, you know, we all got to get used to uh, the game-like scenarios because it's a lot different from practice. But uh, I think we did a lot better uh, this past weekend. See, when he said that, that freaked me out a little bit. You're not having a... 65 play scrimmage during week you're limited in how much hitting you can do but man i mean you you just listen to some former guys or you talk to some former guys and it was hell week every week so saturday wasn't Mm. and what is the preparation like for for saturday game plan yeah but just when it comes to physically getting prepared Tackling. What are you tackling? Are you tackling a donut? Are you thudding up against uh, somebody that's got 4-2 speed as well? That needs to change. Hopefully that has changed for Nebraska because there is talent on the defense. They've got some depth. They just got to get familiarity. And if if they have a chance to – they do have a chance, but if they go out there and get uh, get some some sea legs – Right, they get some some momentum under their belt. They can really flip around what's been a really rough first two weeks for them, uh, and they can flip it around, get off the field, make some open field tackles, uh, disrupt the quarterback, make him move his feet like Kaz was talking about, and then let the offense do their job and hold on to the football and ground and pound. And I like what you said about I mean, talk to any of the guys from the '90s. They all will say. For the most part, practice was harder than the game on Saturday in terms of the quality of people we were going up against at practice and the physicality of practice. Practice was more difficult Monday through Friday than it was on Saturday. Now, I look at this Husker team. I don't think their week of practice before North Dakota was harder than the game itself. And you're coming off, uh, Which you're coming, was you're, weird. You're, you're coming off an international trip, and apparently there were some guys that were sick last week. But my point still stands is that it looked like Nebraska came out on Saturday and they were lethargic because they had one of those relaxing weeks of practice where we're trying to get you guys back acclimated. Sure, Nebraska got a win. I'm curious to see what it looks like against Georgia Southern, but that's almost been the story to me from what my eyes have seen over the past couple of years. Is It's been a case of it does not look like Nebraska is practicing in a way where practice is more difficult than the game. It looks like the game is a hell of a lot more difficult. And I think about the top programs in the country, the Bamas, the Ohio States, uh, just th- that echelon of program. Georgia, do you think that their practices are, are the same way it was back in the 90s where it's harder than the game on Saturday? Maybe not all the time, but for the most part, I believe probably, yeah, I, I think Georgia probably had a harder week of practice against their backups than they did playing Oregon last Saturday. Well, and think about who their backups are, though. Five stars. Right, it's the next round of first through third round picks, theoretically. But yeah, Nick Saban, <laughs> there may be a limited contact rule in the NCAA bylaw, but Nick Saban's going to 
gonna 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 drive his team. There's probably a reason some Bama guys have some short shelf lives in the NFL. Well, you've got a lot of miles accumulated, mm-hmm. all right? Because practice is harder than the game. It is. Uh, I want to tell you about your your friends at Red Zone Tickets. And they've been having fun since 2001. You need tickets. You want to get to that Oklahoma game. Got a concert coming to town. How about Red Zone Tickets? Buys and sells tickets for all types of events. That's Husker football and volleyball. Big one at CHI tonight. Uh, NFL action. Want to go see Denver, Kansas City. How about Creighton basketball? Concerts, theater, the College World Series. Log on today and visit redzonetickets.com. Red Zone Tickets located in Omaha. Very reliable. A local source. Local is better, right? And an A-plus better business rating with the 100% guarantee on all orders. And you'll receive authentic tickets and experiences you'll never forget. How about that moment? Go with your son or daughter taking dad to the ball game red zone tickets can make that happen for you redzonetickets.com and it's time to check off that bucket list and create the memory that lasts a lifetime visit redzonetickets.com today redzonetickets.com quick time out and we'll spend some time with mr husker football he's seen uh, a ton of ball and a big game saturday night oklahoma looms mike babcock's on the way with hail varsity we're presented by currency and now and now back to hail varsity radio Thanks for spending time. It's Hale Bar City Radio. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. We're presented by Currency. We are streaming live ESPN Lincoln Facebook, ESPN Lincoln Twitter. And we welcome in historian, author, Hall of Famer, Mr. Husker Football, Mike Babcock with us at MD Babs on Twitter. Babbers, how are we doing today? Doing fine. I'm looking forward to the uh, volleyball match. A lot of excitement there. And, uh, Georgia Southern coming to town so that we can move beyond that and get ready for Oklahoma. Right on. Let's uh, let's see some market improvement if you're a Nebraska <laughs> fan and then bring on Barry, bring on the Boz, bring on the – when's the last time – had they ever brought the Sooner Schooner up? Let's just dive into Oklahoma week. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. And as the team is looking uh, not past – Georgia Southern. Right. I don't think we can look past that either. I think you're right. I think you're right. But I'd like to look past Georgia Southern, but no, I don't think, I don't think we're in a position yeah. to do that right now. I'm absolutely <laughs> intrigued. I don't think you can do that. I'm intrigued by this, Mike. Let's let's talk about some things that Nebraska can put in their back pocket from last week to this week. What do you think they build on? What are some some improvements you saw that you liked? Well, you know, first of all, I think that you guys hit it on the head you know the the it's a shocking tone to babber's voice <laughs> the ones versus ones in practice I, you know i just a couple of things i remember about that you know that national championship run under osborne um in the in the 90s um ones versus ones in practice and the ability with the numbers and and so forth to have multiple stations in practice so even if you weren't on a you weren't a starter, um, you were getting a lot of reps in practice because sometimes they'd have, I think they'd have three stations, first, second, and third team guys were getting an opportunity to get reps in practice. That was really important, I think, you know, from a depth standpoint. And then the ones versus ones was really important because it was, in fact, I think in many cases, um, it was more difficult physically during practice than it was when you got to the game because you were it was so demanding in practice. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, unrelated but related, um, I, I thought in the second half, particularly the fourth quarter, Nebraska basically wore down North Dakota because you're playing a, you're playing an, an FCS team that doesn't have as nearly as many uh, scholarships as you do, um, doesn't have nearly the depth that you do. And I think that North Dakota wore down physically um, because and if, if for no other reason, because of the numbers thing. And uh, so I think you, you hit it, hit the nail on the head there that, uh, you know, you got to be physical in practice. That's, that's really important, but it, it's kind of not that way 
because there's now concern about injuries and, you know, you want to keep guys healthy and so forth. But um, that wasn't the that wasn't the situation in the in the 90s. Well, Mike, it's just a it's a different world with the the amount of physicality you're allowed and some teams either recruit tacklers or bullies on the football field or you got to develop them into that and you've just got this situation where nebraska's they're playing young kids at some point this this line is going to be super talented and super physical but right now they're so young in their careers that they're they're just not there. They're just not. I mean, they they could still be uh, guys that are second team or getting weight room work, getting lab work, right? Back in the day, but I, I mean, you're you're in a catch twenty two with what you're limited to do, and also from a philosophical standpoint, there isn't many Bill Snyder's or Nick Saban's around that still have a three-station practice or a four-station practice. That's how you win. That's how great you develop. But a lot of programs won't and don't do it. They have a pro-style practice. And um, you see the t- you see the teams that, that spend time on development, uh, Wisconsin, Iowa. I don't know what, what flex practice schedule is like, but they aren't throwing a bunch of young pups in, per se, on the lines. They've got guys that uh, have been able to, to be in the lab for a year or two and then earn their way on. Nebraska seems to be playing a lot of young guys, and it's been a repeat deal. Yeah, th- that's true. And I think another thing that you have to learn, you know, in addition to being able to mesh, you've got a lot of new guys fitting in. We've talked about that probably every week since we've been talking about football. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, it, it's it's also the discipline part of it. And, I, you know, I think that Elijah made a good point earlier about um, – you know, you, you can do your job as a defensive lineman and not have any tackles. I think the tendency is to, to look at the tackles and see, you know, who, who played well. But those defensive linemen, that's not necessarily what they're about. They're about tying up, uh, uh, you know, the offensive linemen get, so that the linebackers are freed up to make plays or the guys in the, in the, in the second uh, liner are, are in a position to make the play. And that requires discipline. That's the other thing that I think is really important to learn is discipline. Do what you're supposed to do first. Get that discipline. And I don't know that Nebraska has always – I don't know that I've seen that consistently, that kind of discipline. And some of it is just enthusiasm, trying to make a play, you know, just mm-hmm. go out there and just go crazy and, and try to make, make that play. But your first concern has to be discipline. Do the job that you're supposed to do. And then if you're in a position to make the play, make the play. But don't be running around out there, you know, trying to make plays when when you're being undisciplined. I really think that's not going to get the job done. Well, yeah, Mike, that's what, what we got preached to in high school football. I know it's at level, but they were telling us, you can be a guy with zero tackles and you can be the, the player of the defense. We can go back and watch that in film. You might not get your name in the paper. But conversely, you can be a, a, a defensive tackle with eight tackles and you can be playing your technique wrong all game because you're seven, eight yards in defensive backfield making a play. And yeah, you'll get your name in the paper for getting all these tackles, but it doesn't mean you had a good game at all. And that, that's why I think people say that that work on the lines of scrimmage, both offensively and defensively, it's not sexy. Um, and it's what wins you football games, the Big Ten, despite the fact that it's not sexy. So is this a, a, a ticking clock for Nebraska here where you really need to see signs of progress? And I think we saw some signs of progress in the second half against North Dakota with this defensive line, uh, being able to, to plug up things a little bit better, leaving the linebackers free and on the offensive side of the ball too. They they uh, they went to the body, if you will, if you use a boxing term, and, and wore down North Dakota over the course of a game. But is this a game where, where you really need to see progress or warning bells are going to start going off? Or have those warning bells already gone off in your head with Nebraska's lines of scrimmage? Well, you know, I really thought that the Northwestern thing was a must win. You know, I've had to adjust my opinion of that. Um, you've got – you had the North Dakota game. Now you've got the G- Georgia Southern game. It's almost like those are scheduled wins. You're you're expected to win those games. So, yeah, you need to see progress against Georgia Southern. It's difficult to say the degree of progress that you're making because, again, you're playing an FCS team. It's, it's a little bit different kind of a situation. But you need to show progress because 
you've got to be prepared when it comes time for Oklahoma week, the week after. But again, I want to emphasize, you can't be looking past uh, Georgia Southern. You've got to be focused on that. And, and, and Mike, you've got to be focused on the physicality part. Yeah, yeah. What does progress look like to you? Is it that eye test physicality? Is it uh, how many yards Georgia Southern is going to be gaining on Saturday? Well, what, what does progress look like for you? I, it looks like physicality. I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to look at a lot of statistics other than n- score numbers. I mean, you don't want to see a bunch of bunch of uh, points on the board for for Georgia Southern. But no, I'm I'm looking for physicality. I'm looking for discipline. I'm not, you know, I, I'm looking for situations where guys are where they're supposed to be. Uh, and you can kind of tell that even if you don't know exactly what the scheme is, you can kind of tell if a guy's running around out there um, just trying to make a play and not being disciplined. Um, those are the kind of things that I think you have to be able to do. If you're going to be successful um, on down the road, um, you've got to be physical and you've got to be disciplined. I think those are the the most important things. Mike Babcock's with us from HailVarsity.com and magazine at MD Babs on Twitter. Mike, just a couple of minutes. Uh, Anthony Grant, uh, where is he at for you when it comes to Husker running backs? I know it's just been two games, but does he remind you of anybody? Is he a guy that you think can be really special? He's had a special start. Well, he's had a social start. That's right. I think he can be. You know, I think Scott Frost said after the game, you know, don't be clearing the space yet for retiring his number. And That was kind of funny. <laughs> you no. Know, oh, we're losing Babbers. Mike, do we have you? Um, yeah. I can see you guys. Okay, we now, now we got you back. <laughs> now we had frozen babbers, <laughs> little Austin Powers. Yeah, the unfortunate <laughs> thing was I said something. Some... <laughs> the, the gremlins are back. Son of a gun. We need Mike to type it to us <laughs> so he can relay it. We're in the, we're in the process of. I'm back to where I was. So. Mike, about 30 seconds. Go. go ahead. Real, real quick. <laughs> Cliff notes, my man. All right. Mike's going to take out a velvet hand. I, you know, I don't compare running backs. I, I think okay. <laughs> it's probably my problem here. No, you're all right. Mike's probably gonna, my computer. Mike's going to take out a velvet hammer and just go Melito Perez on on his uh, <laughs> on his screen. No, and I, it probably is our fault here for trying to go through that technology of, of freezing Babbers Sunday through Tuesday and Thursday through, I guess, Thursday through Tuesday to, to keep him on this. Uh, this radio segment for forever, you know, keep that longevity going. Yes. That, that could be our fault. Mike, we're uh, we're up against a break, but good for you not comparing running backs. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love Thanks it. for having me, guys. Appreciate you. Mike Babcock with us from Hale Varsity, uh, dot com and Magazine. New issue is coming out. You can get your subscription today and do so. Uh, by logging on hailvarsity.com backslash subscribe. Get the digital, get the magazine, make it happen. And uh, when you visit Hale Varsity Club in La Vista, also uh, find your way to some great uh, perks by being a Hale Varsity subscriber. I know it seems long off, but really, I think of Hale Varsity Magazine, what a great gift it is. Totally. I've, I've given it to family members for, for Christmas. Uh, those family members, you know, aren't living close to Lincoln. They don't get that that Nebraska news that uh, I know that they want, even if they it's don't the want anti-cousin it. the anti-Cousin Eddie. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to send you a Hale Varsity Magazine subscription. Congrats. Yeah, and all of a sudden, Huskers. you jump up the old top 25 of mm-hmm. of, of, of uh, kin. Yeah. You just move up the ladder. Great for birthdays, too. I, I've thought about a wedding gift, Hale Varsity Magazine. I'm not sure if that would put me on You know what the, I'm going to uh, do, man? I'm going to get my wife for a, for a, for a 19th anniversary. I'm going to get her a subscription. <laughs> I'm going to get Mama Bear a subscription. Mike Shuhard coming up. And in hour two, Evan Bland joins us. Zach Wiegert on the way. And now. And now. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. About 30 minutes away, Zach Wieger going to be with us. We are presented to you by Currency, Hale Bar City Radio, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. I was going to come see Mike Schuhart Sunday at the Swim Up Bar in Wilderness Ridge. 
COVID and quarantine prevented that post-fantasy draft. We say hi to Mike Shuart. Shuey, I have missed you, my man. How are we doing? I'm doing good. I miss you. I'm glad you're on the mend. I'm working on it. I, I'm, I'm almost to the point where I'm going to show up unannounced and you're going to help me learn how to putt. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> you think. Uh, I think. <laughs> it, ain't, it ain't a you problem, man. Uh, so well, Maybe all you need is the right equipment, maybe a, a couple hundred thousand dollar putter. Uh, what would you think of that Tiger Woods putter uh, auctioned off Shuey for what was the number, Elijah? Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Two hundred and fifty. Two five zero for a Tiger Woods putter. Shuey, do you have any golf memorabilia? Have you? Has anyone ever said, Shuey, I need you to sign this flag, or vice versa? Do you have? I mean, you played in a lot of majors, so I'm, I'm wondering how does that work? Is it like the NFL jerseys where guys? trade hats or here's a sleeve of golf balls or am I just being a geek? No, there's some of that that goes on. Not a lot. Most of those guys that like the tour professionals, yeah. they like their stuff. They don't like to get rid of it very often. <laughs> so they they kind of keep it and hoard it for a while. Every now and then you get something out of them, but no, they like to hoard it. They like their stuff. Shuey, where are you at so far? We always turn to you. I know golf is what you've done for, for years, but you're a big old football fan. How are you feeling about Big Red this year? Mm. Uh, can I say no comment? <laughs> you, you can, that's not like you, but yeah, you can, you can sure say no comment. You got to like the running no. game, don't you? No. they were. I was really hyped up at the beginning of the season, then I was – very excited watching the first quarter mm-hmm. of the first game, and then oh, everything went up. Yeah. yeah. So there are some things I like. I like our new quarterback. I think he's pretty good. Mm-hmm. We got a couple of stud running backs. I mean, we just. I mean, for us to win games, man, we got to get both of our sides of our lines taken care of, and they're not very good. No, and and that's where we need to spend a minute. I I don't know if they're just not going to be good or if they're still a work in progress not good and they'll get better. I think I think they'll get better, but you've got you got some dudes on the horizon and and who knows. I mean, uh, Georgia Southern, I I'm super intrigued if this thing's going to be a shootout or if Nebraska just grounds and pounds them and keep in place keep away. Yeah, I would hope that's what they would do because you would think that's their advantage. You don't want to get in a shootout with anybody because your propensity to turn the ball over in those type of things are not good. <laughs> no kidding. You know, so they, they look better in that. I mean, penalties are down, turnovers are somewhat down. You know, not like been in the past. Mm-hmm. So at least that there's a lot of positive. But bottom line is they still can't control a team like they need to control and they lose, you know, and it's like, you're struggling with the FCS school, man. What are you going to do with Michigan? You know, and watching some of the other big 10 games. I mean, they're every team in the big 10 has gotten better. Mm -hmm. Have we, I mean, it it doesn't seem that way. I mean, not on the lines. No, you know, and the parts that to me are the most important, you know, it's like the thing that I've always, struggled with is that to me one of your most important positions is your center and it's like when is the last time we had a center that was not converted Mm. we're always putting somebody that's a converted other position player as our center it's like probably caputo yeah maybe you know it's like it i don't know if it has worked out it's been okay but when's the last time back in the days when we were really good man we had centers that's what they came here to do is to be a center and they were really good at it now we just decide that take one of your most important positions and just kind of see if we can convert somebody and see if they're any good i mean it doesn't sound like a very good uh process to go through 
Well, Mike, the, the old saying in golf is, you know, drive for show, putt for dough, and Happy Gilmore learned that the hard way. I mean, he had those 400-yard drives, but couldn't do anything around the greens, and that almost might be my comparison for Husker football this season, where, yeah, you got a quarterback, you got the wide receivers, you, you got the things that make your eyes pop preseason and go, yeah, the, this team's got it, but then they get around the putting green, they, they have to run the football, and uh, they, they can't run the ball for dough, if you will. Is that an accurate comparison that – Nebraska this season kind of looks like like Happy Gilmore did on, on the golf field where, or the golf uh, course where, yeah, the, the drive looks great, but you, you can't putt. And yeah, no the, the, clown's the, mouth, Shuey. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's a pretty good, accurate uh, description. I mean, you walk down the range and you watch guys swing at it and hit golf balls, and they're like, damn, that guy must be a really good player. You know, and then you look at what he shot at the end of the day, and he shot 80, so it's like, mm, man, he looked really good, but – plays like crap so it's like some of us are still striving for 80 shuey uh, <laughs> mike shuard's with us wilderness ridge golf shuey before we let you go here bud what's happening with wilderness ridge what's going on fall golf wise great time of year around the corner yeah this is the best time of the year man because the weather starts to cool off a little bit so the pool man our pool's only got one more week then it closes down but it was been a happening place i mean monday was crazy you know, I kind of had a, had a DJ out there. It was packed. People were dancing and singing and enjoying uh, the pool and the weather. So we got one more week of that, and that pool gets shut down. And But then it's time to golf. Best time of the year to golf. The weather's perfect, you know, and still got a lot of good golf days left. Shuey, uh, let me ask you, DJ was going. Were you putting some requests in? Uh, no, I don't think my request would be very good dance music. No, you're going heavy Zeppelin. I know you are. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. all the way. We need uh, we need Misty Mountain Hop. Mike has requested that for a 48th time in a row. Should, should we, with, with, with the last minute here, I, I want to ask you because I've seen how my front lawn has been looking, and I know we've asked you a couple times about how wilderness is looking. It's, it's looking better than my front lawn is the best way to say how, how your course is looking. But <laughs> can you remember a summer that's been this brutal in terms of rain at the end, the courses going dry all, all over the city? And I'm sure your ground screw has earned their paychecks uh, this summer, but do you remember one yeah. this bad? Never. Never in my entire life. And I've been in golf all of my life, mm-hmm. and I grew up on a golf course, and I've never seen anything like this. I mean, it's it's crazy, you know, and just talking to different people that, like some of the rules officials that I know on tour, I talked to one just the other day, and uh, it's like it's everywhere. I mean, courses they're having tournaments at, I mean, they're having to do things, you know, c- because the courses are in certain conditions that mm-hmm. you just – you got to play the ball up in the fairway when you never do that. You know, it's just I mean, it's just one of those years. I mean, it's been very strange. Mike Shuart's with us, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Get out, go see Shuey. Get a membership and uh, enjoy uh, your time uh, at uh, Wilderness. Shuey, we will check in next week. Get ready for Oklahoma. How's that sound? Yeah, I can't wait. It's always a good one to watch. Yeah, it is. Appreciate you, brother. We'll talk soon. All right, get well, my man. All right, man. Appreciate you. There he is, Mike Shuhart. We'll wind down hour one. Philip, check that. Evan, Philip played safety. Evan writes for the World Herald. He's coming up in hour two. Chime in 402 466 ESPN or email the show, Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back in Hale Varsity, presented by your friends at Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Hour two, Evan Bland, Omaha World Herald, going to be with us. And College Football Hall of Famer, Husker Hall of Famer, going to be honored during the Nebraska-Oklahoma game. Zach Wiegert joins the show. So we'll check in with Zach, get his take on the offensive line. Uh, pretty excited, man. Dave Remington going to be with us uh, in uh, the end of the week. We will talk with uh, you know, the greatest to ever play the position, Dave Remington, and uh, check in with him. 
And that is all good. Numbers to get in, 466-3776-466-3776-800-825-5865. We talked a lot today, this first hour, about, all right, there was some, some positive vibes that you took with you offensively, and you think that can translate not only to Saturday, but can maybe translate to Oklahoma. The thing you know about Nebraska is, they can be balanced, right? They can be balanced. We know they can throw the football. We know Nebraska can get some receivers involved, but they also found a way to get it done and, and churn some clock with, uh, with Grant and, and that offensive line got, got some, some lather going, got some rhythm going, which is important. And, Whatever you want to call it, I don't care who's calling the plays. Just make sure it's the right play call. Make sure it's the the right uh, philosophy if you're Nebraska. It's time to run the football, run the damn ball. It's time to to wear out some people with uh, fast dudes over the middle or or go routes. Do that. Make your quarterback part of the run game and protect your quarterback so he's not chopped in half off the edge. Those are still concerns you gotta have if you're Nebraska but you saw you've seen through two games Nebraska can chuck it and Nebraska can run it now can Nebraska run it against big dogs help scheme it up work it out figure it out hit the edges use some quarterback run diversify that way defense is what we're focused on because they they better come out and and play really angry but do their job like we're talking about, but they had to come out and play really angry because it's their turn to step forward and not fall down. And I'd add to that, I think we've seen what this offense is through the past couple of years. I know you've, you've had the Mark Whipple influence this year, but it still looks like a Nebraska offense, and that is not an offense that looks like uh, the, the rest of the Big Ten. This is not an offense that's going to come out it's and run, run it down your throat on first and second down with consistency, and then we'll see what third down looks like before we make our call. It's different. As you said, it's a team that they are going to air it out a little bit more. They're going to play more like a modern college offense, and one of the side effects of that modern college offense is the fact that a team that does want to play in a Big Ten style is going to win the time of possession on you. That's what's going to happen if you can't find a consistent run game and you have to go other methods in order to move the ball. And I don't doubt Nebraska's offense's ability to move the ball. They've always been able to do mm-hmm. it pretty well so since Scott Frost has arrived here on campus. It comes down to can this defense step up? And last year we saw a defense that did pick up did their everything, offense. man. They, they did all the heavy lifting, didn't they? They did all the heavy lifting, and, and they were the, the ones that, that kept you in most of these games and made them one-score losses as opposed to more because that offense, how... how uh, inconsistent they were being able to stay on the field. The, the defense this year, can they step up while the offense goes through some of these growing pains? Because I think this offense can move the ball. It's it's a question of them finding their identity. Well, what you do know is you have an offense that's got some help. It's not going to be all quarterback all the time this year. You'll live and die with some decisions and turnovers by your quarterback. But you've got a run game. You've got some wideouts. You've got help for the quarterback. The question is, can that help come with consistency all year long? No, and it comes out of production and turnovers, right? Reminder to get buckled up, hands on the wheel, eyes and mind. Straight ahead, the driver has one job to drive. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. Evan Bland, Zach Wiegert on the way with Hale Varsity presented by Currency. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Back with you, Tail Bar City Radio Hour 2. We're presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, and we welcome in Evan Bland with the Omaha World. Harold, all things Oscar football and baseball. We'll get in a little volleyball, too, because Evan can attack the net at Evan Bland, O-W-H, <laughs> on Twitter. Evan, pretty historic going on at CHI. How you doing? Yeah, doing well, guys. It's it's a big night, and it's sort of the game day here in the middle of the week, or match day, I suppose, with Nebraska Creighton. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun, man. It's 
it's uh, you know football. People live and breathe it, but volleyball. Uh, I mean, that's sort of the national treasure of this state too. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, volleyball is where you go if you want to see wins. Well, <laughs> I mean, volleyball's carried the flag. I mean, for uh, the, the state, football is football. But man, Coach Cook is as good as it gets. And Evan, you've got two programs meeting, and then this this stage is uh, just going to be is incredible tonight. Give us a thought here on this 6-2 and, and the tweaks that Coach Cook put your volleyball cap on for a second for me anyway and hmm. and uh, and dive in. Uh, not too far into the weeds, but uh, maybe brush up against them. Well, yeah. I mean, it's Nebraska has gone to a 6-2 here now for a number of matches to start the year. They're, they're moving forward with that. And it's, it's interesting because – uh, you know, a lot of times throughout Nebraska volleyball history, they've had some some really good setters in a five one. So so that the five one being where a setter would would rotate through all six spots on the court. Um, you know, Kelly Hunter just a few years ago did it was amazing at it. They've had a number of other, obviously, Gracely Shapiro way back in the day. Um, but the way that this team is constructed with a six two. They feel like uh, going with a two setter system where you where you rotate the setter in in the back row for three spots, and then when her position goes to the front, you bring in a different setter in the back row. The, the reason that you do that is so you can get more of your all American level hitters on the court. So you, you you then are able to put three three hitters in the front row, um, and, and you also do that if you feel really strongly about the, the other two spots you have in the back row. So Lexi Rodriguez as a, as a libero, one of the best in the country. Um, that's another reason that you do that. And so it's a little bit different from what Nebraska has put out there before, but again, they, they, they feel like they have such an embarrassment of riches, especially at that, at that hitter spot um, that you just, you can't, keep those those levels of talent um, sitting on the bench. You have to have those at the net. So um, it, it's an interesting sort of, again, a departure from what Nebraska has done in recent years. It's had success last year, focusing, I think, more on the defensive side, particularly in the back row. I mean, they had some elite passers. They still do. Uh, but there's a little bit more emphasis now uh, – when you, when you look at the strength of this roster uh, with firepower and, and putting that together out there. So, so far, so good. Obviously, Nebraska's sitting there at number two. Creighton's going to be another interesting challenge. They're a top 20 team. They've never beaten Big Sister, right? That's that's sort of the next step for that program. But, um, you know, you look up and down the rosters on both sides, a ton of in-state talent. Uh, volleyball uh, means a ton, not only for those two programs, but you look at the high school club teams, you look at uh, per capita what Nebraska puts out in terms of, of D1 volleyball talent around the country. I mean, it's, it's right near the top. So it, it's going to be cool. It's going to be a celebration of volleyball tonight. Uh, it, it seems almost a certainty that they're going to break the NCAA record for a single match attendance. We'll see if Wisconsin and uh, Florida can break that in a week, but I think Nebraska, Creighton, uh, it's going to be a great match, and it's going to be a celebration of what the sport means in this state. And, and for those that flip the game on tonight, the match on tonight, I should say, Evan, how close to a, a finished product do you think this, this Husker volleyball team is, or how much work still needs to be done? It's obviously early in the season still, and you're, you're talking about the 6-2 and unsure if that's going to be something that gets utilized as the season goes on, but... I mean, in terms of the, the rotations and who the players uh, are that they're featuring in these matches, how close do you think this team is to a finished product? Um, probably not. I mean, you know, they, they feel like they, they know who those players are, but this is the time of year when you always are working through rotations. I mean, Nebraska's done this for decades under Coach Cook. You put together a strong non-conference. You, you tweak some things. You try some different things, like they're doing, they're doing with the 6-2. Um, you know, you, you, you rotate some players in there. Who's able to step up and and sort of uh, you know embrace the pressure of the moment when you reload the way that Nebraska is going to do and has done again this year. Um, so you know, I, I think you have a sense at a few positions. Obviously, again, Lexi Rodriguez at LeBaron, we feel pretty good about. Um, they have so many outside hitters and, and middles now that you're bringing in that, you know, that's, that's probably something you're still uh, sorting through a little bit. And then a, a lot of it's the other stuff. It's, it's uh, emphasis on, on serving. I mean, that's something that, that uh, coach cook was not happy with last weekend was, um, you know, serves into the net mental errors like that. So can Nebraska um, in that regard, walk the line between serving tough, but not giving away points uh, with a ton of service errors too. And so, you know, for Nebraska, 
it, it's different than a lot of programs, right? Like this is sort of the volleyball version of Alabama and Georgia and football where it's sort of this path to the final four. That's, that's sort of the context of this season as it is most seasons for Nebraska volleyball. It's about, um, you know, this is the time of year when you tweak some things, you see what the best combinations are and, and you know, that <laughs> history would tell you Nebraska is going to figure this thing out and they're going to, um, you know, be a, a national title contender again. But I think, again, you look back on some of the recent teams, the way that they played in September uh, wasn't always how it was going to look in November and December. Evan Bland is with us, Omaha World Herald, Hail Varsity Radio, at Evan Bland, O-W-H on Twitter. John Cook does an incredible job of developing, recruiting, and and just coaching talent. I mean, it's just the trifecta there. And the, whatever he does in practice translates more times than not onto the court. I want to switch to football when it comes to Nebraska, Evan, and uh, a couple of comments from, from Ty Robinson we, we touched on to start the show, but just he mentioned practice and prep, and it just feels like from a confidence standpoint, guys weren't uber confident going in to the North Dakota game. Not that they were fearing lo- losing, but just all right, once adversity hits, how are we going to react? Kind of that, that thought bubble going on. Well, you found a way to, to – finish off North Dakota, here comes Georgia Southern. As you gauge Nebraska right now, do you have a decent finger on their pulse? Do you know what what, the, you, that what you're going to see on Saturday, or are you, like a lot of us, wondering what Nebraska shows up? Does a different Nebraska show up? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I don't I, I can't say I know which Nebraska is going to show up or how close this game is going to be. Uh, but, you know, it, it, we talk about, like, on the volleyball side, how close to a finished product is this. I think on the, on the football side, especially when we're talking about the defense, there's a ways to go. I mean, again, Ty Robinson is playing with uh, alongside two guys who've been in the program a matter of months in Stefan Wynn and Devin Drew. I mean, Devin Drew uh, got on campus, uh, like, in August, right? Like, so, so I think part of that is this ongoing – acclimation process of not just the transfers to the system, but then how do those guys interact with some of the veterans like, like Ty Robinson? What, what does that look like in the moment when you have to communicate a call and, and when you have to trust the person next to you to do their job? And, and, you know, you just don't know because you haven't gone through that with them before. And so I think that's part of it. And then, you know, you can back up a level on that defense and say, well, they were missing Nick Henrich too, co-captain, one of the the, the most accomplished defenders in that in that uh, unit. And you've got back there, you know, a true freshman in Ernest Hausman who's going to be a really good player long term, but he's still adjusting to the college game. Uh, Chris Kalarvik, who they wanted at nickel and have moved back to to provide depth right there. So it's very much a a front seven. I think in transition as it continues to figure itself out. So, you know, part of that was, I suppose what North Dakota did last week, but part of that was, was again, sort of that, that learning curve that this front seven and in particular is going through right now. So can they figure it out this week? I mean, we'll see, I think Georgia Southern's the, the last best opportunity to sort of be, come together and, and, and work through your, your rotations. I mean, again, you look at a guy like Wynn and, and Drew, they saw a lot more snaps in game two than they did in game one, and you would expect that to continue as they uh, move along through the season here. But, um, yeah, I, I, it feels to me like a team that's still kind of learning about each other, learning what it does well, learning its identity. Um, and, and, you know, the, the competition level is going to be shooting up here real quick with Oklahoma and then the Big Ten slate coming after that. So, you know, to, I think if you want to have some good vibes heading into that gauntlet coming up, uh, ha- having sort of a drama-free um, fundamentally sound sort of weekend against Georgia Southern would be just what uh, Nebraska is looking for. Evan, did you see a, a potential uh, moment in this season at, at halftime of North Dakota from what that interior defensive line and really what the defense as a whole was doing in the first half as compared to the second half? The, the first half felt like North Dakota had some big rushing lanes to, to run through. Uh, the defensive line didn't always look like they were in it, but th- that changed a little bit in the second half. North Dakota had less going offensively. Do you think that could have been a, a bit of a turning point for this defensive line in terms of figuring out and everyone doing their own job along the defensive line and helping out the defense as a whole? 
Uh, maybe. I mean, yeah, if, if that continues moving forward and, and there's a little bit more of a rapport there and guys are confident in their assignments and in the calls and all that, then, then yeah, you could maybe look back on that moment as when they figured some things out. I mean, I think you're going to have to see it against uh, a little bit higher caliber of opponent. I mean, and I don't know that we're going to figure that out this weekend, right? Like Georgia Southern is going to want to pass. And I think even the weekend, the week after that, Oklahoma uh, has has been a pass team in its recent history too. So, you know, some of that, I, I wonder how much we'll learn until big 10 play rolls around and you see some offenses that want to just bury you on the ground. So, um, you know, we'll see how that part of the, the equation goes. But again, you just look you look up and down the line, and it's it's a group that just needs experience. I mean, Colton Feast as a walk on has been a great story. He this is his first taste of, of big action. Um, you know, we mentioned the transfers, Nash Hotmacher, somebody else who has been in the program a couple years, but he's not had the level of meaningful snaps that he's getting now. So I just think you know, again, you, you have to you have to get the experience somehow. You want to get it while winning football games. And I think this is a good weekend to continue to sort of build that institutional knowledge, maybe uh, among that line um, for when the challenges are going to get tougher. Evan, what do you think of Georgia Southern and and what do they present with, with Helton coming in? I know they're going to chuck the football around, but it sounds like, and it feels like uh, Nebraska better still be working on (laughs) some open field tackling because that's, that's their game. Right, exactly. I mean, they'll. I, you hear some lip service, I think, from Nebraska players this week saying, "Well, you know, you got to you got to play against the run first, and that's true." But yes, I mean, the way that Georgia Southern is going to want to attack is a way that it's it, that has been a struggle for Nebraska at times. They want to get the ball with quick passes to guys in space, um, and then let those guys do their thing. And, and as we've seen, um, Nebraska, the, like the 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 trust level that you have that Nebraska is going to be a sound tackling team isn't all that high through two weeks. I mean, there, there've been a number of mistakes and as Eric Janander pointed out this week, a lot of them have come on third downs that have extended drives and allowed opponents to keep the ball another, you know, two, three, four minutes, whatever it is. Um, and so they, they, Nebraska hopes they've got that cleaned up this week and maybe more, you know, ones on ones will help with that and smooth that over a bit as they, work through that but certainly it's a different sort of challenge because it, it, it also sort of neutralizes what Nebraska thinks it can do well which is rush rush the passer and so if you have a guy Cal Van Trees who's uh, you know who gets the ball out quick doesn't get sacked a lot who oh by the way happened to play in Memorial Stadium last year with Buffalo and probably won't be intimidated by the environment as a guy who's been here before uh, it is it's it's sort of a sneaky challenge and you add to that the fact that Georgia Southern had its way uh, in its opener with Morgan State, and um, you know that can carry a little bit of value too. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's probably an appropriate sort of uh, next step up uh, sort of challenge for Nebraska um, again before the caliber of athlete really picks up uh, in the weeks to come. Evan Bland is with us here from the Omaha World Herald. And Evan, with the last about ninety seconds we have here, let's flip to the offensive side of the ball. Is the game plan going to be feeding Anthony Grant early and often? That seems to be what, what the lesson learned last week was between the first half and the second half was a stronger dose of that run game. Do you see that carrying on against Georgia Southern? Uh, you'd hope so, right. I mean, they they clearly uh, you know found a guy who has a lot of the, the traits that they've been looking for since Divina Zigbo left. I mean, I think you saw the vision that Anthony Grant had to see those creases. You saw the patience that he had to wait for a crowd to clear or wait for a gap to open up. And then you saw sort of that home run speed, that ability to break away from defenders and get to the end zone. So, yeah, I think he proved it, and he, he, he proved it in some pretty tense moments. I mean, it, you know, tie game, one-score game in the third quarter when you can feel sort of that anxiety in the crowd, Anthony Grant came through and, and made some plays and generated a lot of that just on his own, on talent and on on effort and that sort of thing. So, I, I would be curious to see how that how he can build on that moving forward, what that can look like against Georgia Southern, and then obviously into the future. But uh, as Nebraska tries to work through its, uh, you know, how it's lost time of possession pretty regularly, I think Anthony Grant would be a potential solution to that. You know, the the, the injuries to quarterbacks Nebraska's had over the years. 
can be mitigated or lessened uh, by a stronger running game. And Casey Thompson took a couple hits last weekend against North Dakota too. So, um, yeah, you would think that that would maybe be plan A for Nebraska moving forward. And uh, they can sort of see yet again if Anthony Grant really is that RB1 that they've been seeking for a while. Evan, thanks for the time today. Good to get caught up, and we'll see you on Saturday, bud. Thanks, guys. Chime in, 402-466-ESPN, or email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Back with you, it's Hail Varsity Radio, presented to you by Currency. We welcome in the College Football Hall of Famer, Husker Hall of Famer, Outland winner, three-time All-Big 8 and uh, 94 All-American, part of the pipeline, Zach Wiegert with us. Zach, good to spend time with you again. How are you? Everything's great. Couldn't be better. Well, hey, it's not this weekend, but next, and it's uh, a team you're familiar with, Nebraska, Oklahoma. You're coming back, and, man, the uh, – the, the gray old lady on 10th and vinyl probably give you one more standing O. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. If you can't get that one, you're in a bad place. But, yeah, no, I, you know, when they originally talked to this one, I got announced that I was going to get put in the Hall of Fame this year. They, Trev asked me, I said, well, there's only one game on the schedule that means that much to me uh, just because, you know, we had a rivalry with Oklahoma when I was there. And it's a – Still, I can't believe it's such a shame they ended that rivalry. That of one game that you would think they would have kept going forever it would have been that one. But, um, but uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know really what they have planned. I'm excited about it. Uh, we've got actually a lot of uh, ex players that we know from Nebraska and a bunch of guys that we know from that played at Oklahoma all coming to hang out with us and tailgate before and after the game. So it should be a fun time. Zach Wiegert's with us. Zach, you, you grew up in Nebraska. Did you watch Nebraska Oklahoma growing up? I did. Actually, the first game, Nebraska game I ever went to was my brother. I was a, a freshman or a sophomore and a freshman. He was in high school and uh it was Nebraska Oklahoma game. So that was the first actually in person Nebraska game I ever saw was my brother was being recruited mm. uh by Nebraska his senior year. I was a freshman in high school. You know, I grew up watching it on TV obviously if you're from Nebraska and you you didn't. Uh, you could probably watch, you know, uh, hundreds of hours of games just being in the room when it's on because it was all on every TV wherever you were. So, um, but uh, yeah, that's my my very first game with Oklahoma Nebraska. Do you have an opinion? Did you have an opinion on the Boz growing up? On the Boz. On the Boz. Uh, you know. You know, my opinion of uh, he was a great marketer. Let's say that. <laughs> I think he was a great college football player. Uh, and some of the uh, some of the pro stuff. I like a couple of his movies, um, but uh, you know, I, I have to say, uh, when I did, went to the Shrine Bowl my senior year, I did the little the little buzz side haircut, you know, the old mullet look that he had. That was kind of the thing. So he definitely had uh, was a trendsetter of nothing else. Do you have a Blu-ray copy of Stone Cold? Is what you're telling me? <laughs> exactly, Stone Cold, man. Yeah, it's not a bad movie. I thought I thought it was. Getting in the movies and acting was a, was a bad idea, but he's, he's pretty decent. Zach Wiegert, a few minutes with us. Hail Varsity Radio. He'll uh, be honored during Nebraska, Oklahoma, as uh, college football inductee, college football Hall of Fame. Zach, uh, you've been following much of, of Nebraska. Uh, what's your take so far? They're uh, able to get the run game going a little bit better in the second yeah. half last week. Yeah, you know, obviously I'd like to see him be, be more physical. Uh, I mean, I think that's across the board. I just, you know, I grew up and then with, you know, from the time I played and, you know, played till I was 35, you know, I was kind of with a mindset of it. You have, first thing you have to do is be able to run and stop the run. That's where football starts and ends. And I'm a, I've always been and always will be a firm believer in that. I'd take one rushing yard for every two passing yards any day. So, um, and it's just a, it's a tempo setter for the game. You know, I'd love to get us to be back and just be like, hey, here's what, here's what we do, stop us. I mean, that was kind of always our mentality. Um, and so, um, you know, I think the biggest thing I'd like to see is just more physicality in the line play. 
uh, a lot of that is scheme, I think. You know, we just, we kind of, our scheme was just come off and try to knock people backwards instead of run sideways. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd like to see more of that happen on both sides of the ball, frankly. But, um, you know, hopefully they, they keep improving and get a, you know, get a win here against Oklahoma. That'd be great. Zach, uh, at what point did you have trust with, with your, your pipeline mates? You guys all came up together for the most part. And, I mean, it's the line that, that every other line is judged by, what you guys did and uh, the standards you set. And you, there's just a ton of talk about new faces, not only coaches and players, but that, that part of gelling on the line. At what point did, did the pipeline, uh, I, get, I guess, get really cohesive together? Yeah, I would say probably like our sophomore year. Um, you know, as a, a part of us, a couple of us redshirted mm -hmm. my first year and a couple played freshman ball. So that's when we still had freshman ball. That was, I think it was the last year they had freshman ball. So then the next year, uh, Rob and I played varsity and a couple of guys played, uh, were redshirted their second year. So probably our sophomore year, we all got together and started playing all together. But I think the, the bonding and the trust really started, you know, just a few weeks after we got there. I mean, it was very apparent that everything we – we were fortunate. Our class was like everything was a competition. You know, it was who worked out, the, who was the strongest, who stayed the longest, who ate the most, who ran the fastest, who, you know, who talks the most, who, who doesn't talk. Who, I mean, everything was a competition with us. And um, I think that that was what made us such a close group because everyone was not one to let the other guy down. Zach Wiegert was with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, Zach, I want to compare your offensive line a little bit to what we're seeing now because you guys were full of experience, a lot of upperclassmen in your offensive line once you guys finally made it on the field on Saturdays. And you compare it to, to this year's, and you got a lot of underclassmen, a lot of guys who are inexperienced when it comes to Big Ten play. And I want to ask you what you think the importance of, of sitting for a couple years as an offensive lineman is, getting your reps in and practice, and then uh, biding your time before it's finally uh, your time to be the guy uh, leading out the uh, the offense on a Saturday. Yeah, there's. I would agree with that. Obviously, experience is big, and jailing on an offensive line is big. I mean, the more you play next to the same people, the more comfortable you are with them doing their job. I mean, the the, the real thing with offensive line is, is you have a job to do. You do that to your best ability, and you just assume the other guy's going to do the same. I mean, that's the only way to play offensive line. The one thing I would say, though, is at, there is at no age where you decide, hey, I'm going to be tough today, right? So, in, you know, regardless of, you know, you couldn't have convinced me I couldn't have beat anyone up when I was a freshman, even though I, I know I couldn't have, and I was twice as strong and faster and bigger when I was a senior. But that it's an attitude thing. And um, I think part of what needs to happen is, is we need to get back to where, you know, it used to be the defensive line was the aggressor and the offensive line was – the shielder. Well, well, the difference is our offensive line played as the aggressor. Mm. So, and I don't know if that's scheme or people or what. I would just love to to get to back to where when our guys walk in the field, the other team's scared of them. Intimidation was big, and and then teams felt it. And Zach, you're you're pretty legendary uh, with your peers, but just those around Husker football, where man, you you would verbally let somebody know where the ball's going and you'd still pancake him. Is, is that urban legend or is that true? No, that happened a lot. Yeah, I used to do that a lot. <laughs> I, a coach wasn't real happy about it. I think Tenemper thought it was pretty funny. Coach Osborne didn't find it amusing. I was telling the other team where the plays were going. But, um, you know, but then about after about six or seven times telling them, and then I'd tell them the opposite and they'd all run the other way. So it, it, it worked both <laughs> ways. But it was just an intimidation thing. You know, when we played a great example, we play Kansas State, you know, we have Terman's our quarterback. He's never taken any plays. Our top two quarterbacks are out. Lawrence Phillips has a broken hand. We have all these injuries. And they had 10 guys at the line of scrimmage. Well, well they knew we were going to run. They can't fit any more guys up on the line of scrimmage. So we're just like, well, you know we're running. We're going to run right here. Well, by the, the fourth quarter, you know, they're going, like, geez, they're telling us where we're running, and we're still getting pounded for 180 yards from Lawrence Phillips. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, about as intimidating as it gets, I think. What was T.O.'s reaction to you? I mean, he may not have liked it, but did he, <laughs> did he call you in? Did he just say, you know yeah. how his dry what, sense of humor what, is? What, 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 did 
did he call me in? Which time did he call me? It wasn't uh, okay. did he call me in? How many times did I sit across from his office and hear about it? <laughs> uh, he's like, is that really necessary? And that, the great thing about coaches is he let the offense and defensive line coaches coach their people. Mm-hmm. You know, we he had this ability to be above the fray because what he would do is he'd take the offense and defensive line, we'd go in the pit, and we'd inevitably we'd come up and there'd be two guys all bloody. You know, and he'd be like, well, what happened? And he always had the ability to say, I wasn't there, so I don't know what happened, and none of us would tell. But there was a fight every day. And it just, and then after the fight's over, everybody's buddies, you know. Mm-hmm. But it was, uh, he did a great job of staying out of that and letting Temper and McBride, who are probably the, arguably the best offensive line coach and one of the best defensive line coaches ever to coach college football, mm-hmm. coach. So, um I think that's part of it too. I mean, those guys were just, you know, you, if you did, if you weren't tough with that crew, you just didn't make it. Mm-hmm. But you know, they they'd take a bull for you and love you to death. So, from a gladiator standpoint, were you a spectator in the pit, or were you active often in the pit? You know, I I did a, most of my fighting in the pros because it's kind of like prison rules you know if you don't make an example of someone they'll always be, be uh, keep getting on you but you know i was talking to trev the other day and i don't remember really getting in, i mean i got in fights don't get me wrong but not a lot down in the pit it was mostly like on the field somebody in the scout team would do something and that but then coach instilled this rule if you got in a fight then you had to run stairs and miraculously i didn't fight anymore after that so, <laughs> it was a miracle because <laughs> what he'd do is, is you got in a fight he'd kick you out of practice so i go sit in the locker room and watch espn and be like well this ain't so bad and then he figured out like i wasn't so worried about getting kicked out of practice but once he starts making you run stairs in your pads then you don't fight anymore <laughs> did, uh, did you lose all your fight <laughs> did, last thought here zach Weger with us and can't wait to see you guys back for oklahoma did did uh, did Trev ever throw down in the pit? To your knowledge, yeah, Tre- Trev. Yes, I, Trev was, does not. He he seems like a really buttoned up nice guy, and he has a great speaking voice, and he's good on TV, and he's really a pretty guy. You know, I mean, he's a pretty guy as far as pretty guys go. But no, Trev doesn't take crap from anybody. Trev is about as aggressive as they come as a football player. So. Yes, I, I'm very sure that Trev and uh, Tre- Trev had plenty of his own fights in, in, in practice. Did uh, was he undefeated? <laughs> was he Mike Tyson down there? In the pit? <laughs> you know, he was there as a freshman one year before I got there, so I can't speak to that year. But uh, yeah, I, I don't remember anyone ever getting the best of him. That's for sure. Zach, we'll uh, <laughs> welcome you back for Oklahoma. Good to spend time with you today. Thanks for the time. Thank you, guys. Take care. It's College Football Hall of Famer, and uh, he'll get his moment. Uh, much deserved Nebraska, Oklahoma. But thought we'd catch up with Zach Wiegert. Pride of Fremont, man. Good to spend time with Zach. Uh, a jock doc on the way as uh, we'll hit on the Achilles heel in Sterling Shepard. Hail Varsity continues, presented by Currency. He's in his 30s. But sounds like he was born with a stogie in one hand and a brew in the other. Now, say my name. It's Schmitty on Hale Varsity Radio. I got the body of a hot preteen Swedish boy. Back with you, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by your friends at Currency. And we welcome in with uh, Nebraska Orthopedic Center a Jock Doc Wednesday, Dr. Brandon Seifert. Dr. Brandon, you got your NFL uh, radar up, kickoff tomorrow. How you doing? I'm doing great, bud. How about you? You got your fantasy team all plugged in? Oh, we, we had the uh, virtual draft because somebody was, was – uh, Quarantined. We're going to point <laughs> fingers. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so first time in forever I missed the in person draft, but I'm sure they had a, a pint for me. And one of the teams <laughs> interesting this season is the New York Giants. What are they going to get at quarterback? What's their offense look like? And their longest tenured receiver, Sterling Shepard, I believe he's a former Sooner in Oklahoma's just around the corner with Nebraska. He's coming back from a torn Achilles. Held out of preseason camp, Dr. Brandon, but he's going to give it a go here in week one. What is he up against with an Achilles injury that's been repaired and coming back? 
Yeah, you know, so they really have kind of made a big deal of his recovery. I think he's about eight months down the road from that process. Um, it sounds like he's doing great. I would say that that really is a, a you know pretty speedy timetable. Most of the time we'll see these kind of at about a year out when they start to make a return. Um, part of that kind of year out thing, though, is always just kind of the timing of when these injuries happen, when surgery happens, when the season starts. I wouldn't say, you know, eight months is unreasonable by any means, but definitely speaks to the fact that he's worked super hard. And if they're already talking to return, he must look great in therapy at this point. He is coming back. His goal was to be back in seven months like Cam Akers. We know what type of Super Bowl Cam had at running back for the Rams. He didn't quite get that seven-month return to play. But he's, you know, looking at a couple of interviews with Sterling Shepard of the Giants, he's not super worried about hits, but it's more the cutting. Let's talk about the stability that uh, that surgical intervention allows uh, when it comes to the repair and, and being just like new or close to new, getting back to action. Yeah, you know, we always like to do a little in, in, you know, anatomy review while we're here. So if you're thinking about Achilles anatomically, everybody knows what it is. Basically, if you feel kind of down towards the top of your heel, there's a, a thick kind of cord structure that's there. That's the Achilles. It basically attaches what you call your calf structures or the two main muscular groups is the gastrocnemius and the soleus. And it brings those two together, forms one solid tendon that hooks you down onto the heel of the calcaneus. And then obviously that helps you when you go up on the ball of your foot pushing off in your foot, that's where the kind of power generator is, is through those calf muscles, translating that force through the Achilles onto the heel, allowing you to push off. So that's essentially anatomically what that looks like. Obviously, he had a tear. They sewed it back together. And so now, as you start to think about that, mechanically, yeah, you don't necessarily worry so much about the contact portion of it. It's more kind of the cutting. You're pushing off. Those toes are pointing down. Um, the one area where you, you do worry some about the uh, contact part of it more if, you know, Sterling is basically making a cut, he's pushing off the turf, and then someone obviously comes in and, like, contacts him, then obviously that force is going to transfer to that area. So that would be one contact zone where you worry about that. Uh, but, yeah, that's always the biggest fear with these is, you know, one, what's the strength like in one of those repairs? So the, the strength is actually great um, in terms of, you know, worried about a re-rupture risk. If you go the surgery route, that re-rupture risk is pretty darn low and kind of gets you back to the, almost the normal level. Um, the biggest battle with these is always, you know, one, redeveloping both kind of the look of your uh, calf musculature, but also more importantly, just the generalized strength of that calf muscle. It takes a long time to get that back. Dr. Brandon Seifer is with us here, a Jock Doc Wednesday on Hale Varsity Radio. And, and Dr. Brandon, I've seen guys on both ends of the spectrum coming back from an Achilles injury uh, in terms of looking like uh, their old self and, and also not. I think of Kobe Bryant, his return from the Achilles injury. He never quite looked like himself after that Achilles injury. But then I look at Von Miller, who came back off an Achilles injury and looked great for the Rams last season in their Super Bowl run. And now he's off another big contract with the Buffalo Bills. What are the, the biggest factors in, in terms of how a guy is going to respond to this and, and whether he's going to look like his old self coming off the injury? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, as you look at the, the data, the research behind kind of recovery for these, you know, there, there definitely are some kind of genetic probably issues that play a role. You know, some patients probably have either A, maybe kind of a different muscular structure in the area. Maybe their strength is more in kind of some surrounding musculature and they don't put as much force to that area. So there's probably a difference in kind of biomechanics and how patients use their muscles in terms of that recovery. Uh, that probably plays a factor. Um, I also think some of the trauma that happens, we always are so focused on actually the tear at the Achilles level. There's probably some trauma that happens even up into the muscular level as well and probably even where that tendon basically starts to form coming off of the muscle, we call that the musculotendinous junction. There's probably, in some of those athletes that kind of struggle to get back, they look different. There's probably more extensive damage that happens kind of further upstream from where that original Achilles injury happened. And that's probably why some of their recovery might be delayed. That might also be why some of those, those athletes look different in terms of what their calf muscle looks like post-operatively, um, just from the atrophy. So that's probably, that probably plays a bigger role. Is it, it probably really is kind of the severity of the injury and some of that's not necessarily all that measurable at least from our imaging tools that we have like for example MRI you may not see a ton of trauma 
further up, but we know there's probably some disruption there that happens further up. And so that would be probably the best way to explain why some athletes you know, are kind of different than others. Age plays a role, and also kind of the severity of, I think, the injury just at that Achilles level itself. You know, as I, I take care of you know, a ton of these, and each one of them is very different. You know, some have kind of a little mild tear, kind of almost straight across, and each end of that tear looks, you know, pretty normal, easy to put that together. Then some of these look like they're, for lack of a better term, just kind of blown apart. There's just little tiny pieces left. There's not great tendon left. And, you know, we know that plays a role in how they recover, too. So even just the severity at the actual tear site. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us, Nebraska Orthopedic Center, a jock doc Wednesday. Dr. Brandon, real quick, uh, when it comes to his position wide receiver, how uh, how stressful is that position when it comes to uh, this specific injury? You know, pretty significant. You know, you start to see those folks that rely upon that, you know, speed, that quick cutting ability, uh, the jumping ability, they tend to be impacted more. Um, and so for him, you know, that's, that's going to be the big question mark is what kind of form can he reestablish? Um, again, he's at, he's at one of those positions that's really going to tax this Achilles, and this would be one of those folks that you potentially might see a difference in. Dr. Brandon, have yourself a good NFL weekend, and we'll get caught up again. Thanks for a few minutes. Okay, fellas, you guys take care. Thank you. Good to talk a little NFL, just a day away. Thursday night football, get your Amazon account reactivated or dusted off. You've got uh, the Rams, you've got the Bills. Excited, man, we'll have Searles with us tomorrow around 5 is our favorite NFLer going to join us, his uh, his boy Josh Allen. My boy Josh Allen. Well, yeah, fantasy your fantasy. <laughs> We've got some input from Brennan and uh, the biggest Husker fan I know in Arizona, Scotty Keith, weighing in. We'll answer some question next as we'll wind down a Wednesday Hail Varsity. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Thanks for hanging out today, and you heard the intro. Check the podcast out, audio-wise, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. Subscribe to Hail Varsity Radio. Tell a buddy, tell a Husker fan, and also find us on YouTube. And can subscribe that way. All the great content from Hale Varsity, video, post-practice, pressers, interviews. But the shows are posted. And if you can stomach my face, Elijah's a beautiful man. Uh, just deal with it that way. The video option is there. We are presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, you go Currency. So big thanks to Zach Wiegert. Good to get caught up with him. He was down, what did he say, Houston? He was down in Houston doing some work, but he'll be back up for the Oklahoma game next weekend. We are awesome. Uh, we are Switzer's in next week. Oh, baby. I don't know that he's in in physically, but he's on. Who cares? Be- better, Switzer's makes for great content yeah, all around. Better, that, better, be way to, better way to go that route with, with Barry. And, you know, we need him up here next next week. And we need him to wear the the Eisenhower beaver jacket, mm. the infamous. We got to find some some audio from a past interview because he's got a beaver and a coyote jacket, and it's the same jacket that, that Jamel Holloway wore on the sideline. That beaver jacket. Check out the '87 game. All right, let's check out Jamal Jamal Jamel Holloway beaver jacket '87 because he showed up to Lincoln with like just short sleeves. It's not quite Oklahoma week. Georgia Southern has our <clears throat> concentration. Searles tomorrow, Brandon Vogel tomorrow, Gary Barnett tomorrow, and then Beeson Sports Network's Danny Burke. It's been a couple weeks since we talked with Danny. Dude, Danny was awesome. I got to walk to the game with him uh, last two weeks ago in Dublin. Stumble to the game. No, I was behaved. I, I kid, I kid. He was fine. Now, if I knew it would have kept me from getting COVID, I would have got blasted. <laughs> <laughs> no such luck. Uh, got a, what do we call this? StreamYard content mm-hmm. and input here by Brennan. 
Do we think uh, the idea of playing mean is a lost art? I mean, we have some big guys that look like they play soft with no attitude. I think that's fair. And I think that's what we were talking about preseason with with the offense line mm-hmm. needing to develop that nasty. There's a For difference sure. between being a good offensive line and being a nasty there, offensive there's lineman. A, there's a ton of Twitter handles out there that dissect film. Mm-hmm. Some media, not some not media. And I just don't know. I'll say this, benefit of the doubt with Turner and with Teddy. Teddy looked good. Teddy Teddy's getting into form. I don't think Turner's right. I think he's, I think he's playing hurt. Hmm. So I mean, because you had one, you had a North Dakota guy take him with one hand and t- chuck him. Yeah, and I, I think personally, from what I've seen, Teddy, I, I think he's he's maybe that one offensive lineman that has a little bit of that nasty in oh. him from what I've seen so far this year. But then yeah, you turn around and in the pass protection, he can be a little suspect at times. So I, I think he's getting getting more with it. Scotty Keith from Arizona, why are we not running option or option pass? That's my favorite play. I think that's a lot of Nebraskans' favorite play. Uh, is the defense uh, too fast anymore? I think it's a matter of not wanting your quarterback mauled. Now, you can pick your spots with quarterback run. You saw one design from Casey last week. Talk to you tomorrow at 4. Thanks for tuning in to Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency.